Thank you uh, very much for coming this evening um, uh, and welcome. Um, I'm George Biddle um, and I have the privilege of chairing the Civil Courage Prize. Um, I want to say a few things that just to start I have to make some thank yous, very important ones. The first is I'd like to express our deep appreciation to NYU. They're a tremendous partner and ally to the Civil Courage Prize and in particular to Josh, Josh Taylor, uh, the Outreach and Mobility Vice President for the university. And I think Josh is here. I haven't had a chance to meet him myself in person just by Zoom, but thank you, Josh. And of course, law professor Philip Alston, who you'll be hearing from later as well. I also want to thank our colleagues at PEN America, um, and particularly CEO Suzanne Nossel, who actually nominated our laureate this evening, as well as her colleague, Kareen Karlikar, the Director of Free Expression at Risk Programs at PEN America. They are also a very valued and trusted partner to the prize, and uh, I just can't thank you enough, Suzanne and Kareen. I don't know how many of you actually know the history of the Civil Courage Prize. Some of you have been to previous um, events that we've had, uh, but it was established almost 25 years ago by our late founder and longtime chairman, John Train, who we just lost last year. John was a critical thinker and a concerned global citizen, and it was out of his concern for his fellow global citizens and the inspiration he drew from the unique bravery of some of them that John decided to establish the Civil Courage Prize. John was moved by the great Soviet dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and it was out of his friendship and admiration for Solzhenitsyn that John began to think about the prize. To John, Solzhenitsyn exemplified civil courage. Solzhenitsyn had single-handedly stood up to the totalitarian Soviet regime at great personal risk. His valor was not on the battlefield, but in a brutal repressive society where he was a sole valiant actor. To honor Solzhenitsyn and others who would follow his path, John established this prize and endowed it through the Train Foundation. The Civil Courage Prize has now been given annually for the past 23 years to an individual or a group who demonstrate steadfast resistance to evil and injustice at great personal risk. John had an extraordinary vision for this prize, and tonight we have a truly extraordinary laureate, Nasreen Sotudeh. In this very difficult and troubling time of unrest around the world, I think it's probably more important than ever to have a reason to hope. Nasreen is one such reason. Her brave fight represents the struggle for women and girls everywhere and was powerfully emphasized by this year's Nobel Prize winner, Nargus Mohammadi. This prize, this Nobel Peace Prize, represents a huge win for all Iranian women. With respect to Nasreen, it is hard to imagine an individual who more epitomizes the qualities of the Civil Courage Prize than she does. Like Solzhenitsyn, she has courageously stood up to her government and challenged it to be more just, fair, and democratic. And in Nasreen's case, particularly for the rights of women and girls. Nasreen has been an indefatigable promoter and highly effective legal defender of women's rights, and in so doing, has inspired others to take up the cause of woman, life, freedom, the rallying cry of women and men who have protested across Iran to demand equal rights. And for us, it's hard to imagine the personal risk that Nasreen has taken on. She has spent many years in Tehran's notorious Evan prison, separated from her husband and two children, and she can't be with us tonight because she's not permitted to leave Iran. I don't think many of us in this room can fathom the exceptional bravery and commitment she possesses, especially as a mother. Nasreen Sotudeh reinstills faith in our belief that a courageous individual can fight for justice, inspire others to act, and, bro and bring momentous, meaningful, and positive change. I could literally go on and on about Nasreen, but there are many others who want to congratulate her tonight and tell you about her remarkable life and the dream of justice that she strives for every single day. We have a packed program this evening, and we will begin with a video from CNN chief international anchor, Christian Amanpour. Immediately afterwards, 
Jeff Kaufman and Marsha Ross will come to the podium to share their reflections on Nasreen and show a clip from their remarkable and inspirational documentary simply titled Nasreen, which you all have to go and watch after this event. Thank you again for joining us to celebrate a truly extraordinary woman. I am so honored, truly honored, to be able to add my voice to the chorus of congratulations for Nasreen Sotoudeh for the Civil Courage Prize. It is an amazing award to be given to a truly remarkable person. I had the honor of being able to speak to Nasreen during her furlough from prison. And she had the courage, even though she knew, and we all knew, that the authorities were watching every move she made, every word she spoke, particularly to foreign reporters. She had the courage to, even then, under furlough, to talk to us about her consistent fight for the rights of women and children that she's waged all her political and, and legal career, uh, for the rights of her friend at that time, an Iranian doctor who was in jail and on hunger strike and very close to death. She spoke up for him and for everyone and for the women of Iran, as I said, as well. Shortly after that interview, her decision to speak to us paid off because the authorities allowed her friend to be released, the civil rights doctor, Farhad Meisami, to be released from Evin prison. So that was a great victory for her and for her decisions. She is really distinguished by not taking her own safety first. Clearly, she worries about her own family and the effect of her campaigns on them. But she thinks not about her own safety, but about the best for the people of Iran. And so in this moment, it's now more than a year since the death of Masa Amini, who was killed after being manhandled by the Iranian regime for, they said, not being dressed appropriately. That started the woman's movement in Iran. And that movement continues, whether or not on the streets right now, but the hopes and the prayers and the legitimate rights of Iranian women and all Iranian people are still at the forefront. So again, congratulations to Nasreen, for her amazing battle that she continues to wage, even in the most difficult circumstances. Good evening, I'm Marsha Ross. I'm Jeff Kaufman. We are here to honor Nazrin Sotoudeh's fearless commitment to human rights and through her pay tribute to all the women and men around the world who face harassment, imprisonment, and even death because they challenge intolerance and repression. To better understand this vision of sacrifice, we want you to know Nazrin not as a public icon, but as a very real person who has paid a high price for her beliefs. Nazreen was imprisoned for over six years because of her support for the rights of women, children, religious and ethnic minorities, journalists, artists, and nonviolent opponents of the Iranian regime. She is also a fierce critic of the death penalty. In 2021, Nazreen was released on a medical furlough while suffering from a heart condition and COVID. The government froze the family bank accounts, prevents her from practicing law, and continually threatens to haul her back to prison to serve out the balance of her decade-long sentence, but she refuses to be silenced. We've been blessed to have a unique friendship with Nazrin and her equally remarkable husband, Reza, that defies the distance between us and the difference in our backgrounds. We are wearing replicas of a button that Reza made that Nazrin had pinned to her coat during her last arrest that says, I oppose the mandatory hijab. When you see Nazrin and Reza together, there's a balance and a respect that's uh, really touching. At the same time, they have a steely strength that has carried them through incredible hardships. No matter how difficult things are, and things are often very difficult for them, we always share something to laugh about, and they always ask about what's going on in our life. They also adore their daughter Merva and their son Nima, and are determined to have them grow up in a stable and nurturing way. That's not easy when a key government tactic is to purposely punish the families of those it deems a threat. You can feel the conflicting emotions in this letter that Nazreen wrote from prison. To my dearest Merva, my daughter, my pride and joy, I greet you from Avin Prison, Ward 209. I come to you without sadness and tears and instead offer you a heart filled with love and best wishes for you and your darling brother. 
When night falls and I lay in my cell, I often think about how I used to put you to sleep and of all the lullabies and songs I sang for you in bed. Please know that you and your brother were my main motivation for pursuing this work. I know that you require food, a home, a family, and love. However, just as much, you need freedom and justice. Every time I came home from court, after having defended a child, I would hold you and him in my arms, finding it hard to let go of your embrace. I believe that the pain that our family and the families of my clients have had to endure over the past years is not in vain. Justice arrives exactly at the time when most of us have given up hope. It arrives when we least expect it. I am certain of it. My only wish for you is a childhood full of happiness and joy. I miss you, my dearest, and I send you 100 kisses. Maman Nazreen. Nazreen and Reza make clear that real greatness is revealed by how one acts in private, not just in public. Being locked up in one of the world's worst prisons, separated from years from your husband and, and children, while still finding ways to confront the authorities, would be more than enough for most people, not Nazreen. One day, a package arrived in the mail from Marsha and me that had traveled a circuitous route from Iran. We carefully opened it and found a stunning piece of artwork, an arrangement of pressed flowers in a homemade frame. We spoke to Reza, and he explained that Nazreen made it in the Vien prison. Somehow, he, it was smuggled out. She had picked flowers in the prison courtyard, a fellow inmate taught her how to dry and press them, and a Baha'i prisoner crafted the frame from scraps of wood. This says everything about Nazreen. She can bring people together to find beauty and meaning in the most unimaginably dark circumstances, and she refuses to accept the way the government and its allies try to control her. In this perilous time, the best way to honor Nazreen so today is to support in whatever way you can the ideas and the efforts of those who strive for human rights and democracy in America, in Iran, and around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Nasrin Sotadeh is a prominent lawyer in Iran who's been fighting for children's rights, women's rights, and human rights. She is one of the bravest voices in Iran. She took on cases that other lawyers were too afraid to take on. We've seen Nasrin Sotadeh jailed for defending human rights. And it has cost her and her young family a lot. Protesting against the law which forces Iranian women to wear the hijab. The country's most prominent human rights activists and a voice for the voiceless. I had been in Iran maybe a week and I knew how to toe the line as a woman. And then I meet Nasrin So today who doesn't toe the line at all. <laughs> On Wednesday, Nasreen Satude was again arrested. She had been tried and convicted in absentia. According to her husband, she intends to continue her activism from prison. We announced that Nasreen uh, would be winning the Civil Courage Prize, and we're going to hear from three such individuals on this next video. Margaret Atwood, world-renowned author and award-winning uh, writer. Uh, Nicholas Kristof, um, also Pulitzer Prize-winning columnist for the New York Times. And Hannah Newman, a distinguished German member of the European Parliament. Nasreen Sotoudeh sets an example for moral courage that is rarely equaled and never surpassed. Nasreen, your courage inspires us all. Nasreen is an Iranian lawyer and prominent voice of conscience 
who has fought for decades to protect the rights of women and children through her legal work, as well as consistently writing and speaking out against injustice. What sets Nasreen apart? Look, at, at one level, it's the ruthlessness of the regime, which the regime proves all the time, which makes it particularly fearsome. But secondly, maybe more important, it's her strength in the face of that to keep on resisting, knowing the price that she will have to pay and that her family will have to pay and, and hats off to her family, which has been behind her through these incredibly difficult uh, times. You know, even when Nasreen is out temporarily from prison, she finds within herself the strength to still speak out on behalf of those who don't have her platform, knowing that she will pay a price for that outspokenness. Nasreen's dedication to justice didn't stop during her own imprisonment. Even in prison, she spoke up for those being in prison with her, for those being outside of the prison wall unjustly threatened, even in public statements while she was in prison. And look, you know, we all know that in Iran, women officially don't count for very much. Uh, that's something she has been uh, upfront about fighting throughout her career. A female eyewitness doesn't count for as much as a male eyewitness in Iran. But Nasreen Sotadeh puts the lie to that. She exemplifies the, the, the virtues of moral courage and strength that are a model for all Iranians, for all of us all around the world. And one example of that is that today, the Iranian regime is more afraid of her than she is of it. Nevertheless, Nazarene continued her work for justice and human rights, making it very clear that her children can only live a just, a true, a fulfilling life if all the children of Iran, if all the people of Iran can enjoy justice and human rights. Over the last year, as thousands of Iranians rose up in a mass movement for women's rights and democracy, Nazreen spoke and wrote in their support. She has authored a new book on the movement titled Women, Life, Freedom, Our Fight for Human Rights and Equality in Iran. Nazreen's legacy has heightened relevance in today's Iran as a new generation struggles for basic rights and gender equality. Her strength and selfless resolve is truly exemplary. I'm Margaret Atwood, and I'm proud to congratulate Nazreen Sodute on being awarded with the Civil Courage Prize. I just want to congratulate you on receiving the Civil Courage Prize, and there is no doubt that your voice will continue to have a profound impact on so many. It clearly has on me. Thank you for your tireless work in advancing justice and human rights. And I hope that you dream that all the political prisons of Iran will soon be turned into museums and parks, will soon become true. The Civil Courage Award was created to honor the memory uh, and example of Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Well, today, Nasreen Sotudeh is Iran Solzhenitsyn. She is Iran's Mandela. And Nasreen, we are all behind you. We are with you. We admire your courage so much. It inspires us. It makes us better people. And the Civil Courage Prize Award uh, to a friend and colleague of Nasreen's who will accept it on her behalf. I'm gonna ask uh, Nina Train, the uh, daughter of John Train, to come up to present the award, and Hale Asfandiari, who is the distinguished fellow and Director Emerit of the Middle East Program at the Wilson Center, who will accept the award on Nasreen's behalf.
Directly from Nasreen. ریاست محترم بنیاد ترین اعضای گرامی هیئت مدیره درودهای صمیمانه مرا از ایران پذیرا باشید کشوری که در یک سال گذشته با شعار زن زندگی آزادی خواست خود را برای احترام به حقوق زنان و رعایت آن مطابق با موازین بین المللی اعلام کرد. وجدان آگاه جهانیان به این مطالبه جواب مثبت داد. در این میان نهادهای مدنی برجسته ای همچون بنیاد ترین که دارای سابقه طولانی در حمایت از فعالان حقوق بشر است جایزه امسال خود را به من اعطا کرده است. ضمن اعلام افتخار از تعلق چنین جایزه ای می خواهم بر درک مشترکمان از اعطای چنین جایزه ای به جنبش فراگیر زن زندگی آزادی تاکید کنم زنانی که شانه راز کرده هم تا دست پدر سالاران را از سرشان کوتاه کنند و البته اینقدر راز کردند به قیمت جانهای زیادی تمام شد چشم هایی که از معترضان رو بوده شد تا نبینند اما چشم های آنان به هزاران چشم دیگر تکثیر شد و جهان به تماشای مردان و زنانی نشست که برای یک زندگی معمولی مبارزه می کنند آغازگر این جنبش دختر جوانی بود که شاید رویاهای زیادی برای ادالت و قانون در سر داشت محساجی نامینی که در گشت ارشاد کشته شد در دنیایی که ما در آن زندگی میکنیم گاه به حمایت از یکدیگر میپردازیم و گاه چنین حمایتی را مطالبه میکنیم اما آنچه باعث جلب این حمایت ها میشود نشان دادن درجه از شهامت مدنی است که حمایت های مؤثر بینالمللی را به همراه میآورد جنبش مدنی در آمریکا یا بهار عربی و جنبش هون کن همگی از داخل ای که به تغییر نیاز داشتند آغاز شدند همانطور که این جنبش ها به پایان نرسیدند و در اشکال دیگری ادامه دارند جنبش ما در ایران نیز تمام نشده است آیا در چنین شرایطی به طور منطقی حق داریم از شهامت مدنی قطع امید کنیم به باور من هرگز هنوز هم با وجود آن که زنان زیادی روزانه در خیابان بدون هجاب اجباری تردد می کنند و شهامت مدنی خود را به نمایش می گذارن. اما در معرض خطر دستگیری یا خشونت قرار دارند. ما برای افزایش شهامت مدنی که از اهداف اصلی بنیاد ترین است زنجیرهای همبستگی را گسترده تر می کنیم تا لحظه تغییر فرا برسد لحظه ای که بر حلقه ای از زنجیر استبداد غلبه کنیم و یکی از حلقه های جادویی را در برابر خود پاره کنیم بی ترس و بی تردید شاید در این میان بسیاری از زنان حلقه پدر سالاری را از سلسل زنجیر استبداد نشانه گرفته باشند در حالی که مردان بسیاری حلقه فقر و تنگ دستی را نشانه می گیرند، هنرمندان و نویسندگان سانسوری را که جانشان را به لب رسانده است نشانه گرفته اند. تلاش های زیادی صورت می گیرد. همبستگی ها از آن سوی دنیا با این طرف دنیا هر روز و پیوست شکل می گیرد. مرز ها نادیده گرفته می شود تا در پرتو مفاهیمی انسانی تر دور هم جمع شویم و با هم سخن بگوییم اما آن لحظه تغییر فرا نمی رسد چرا؟ اجازه دهید به یاد بیاوریم که ما هنوز در میانه راهیم با 
این حال کدام نیروی آزادی خواهد که نخواهد این جنبش زودتر به سمر برسد شاید لازم است این رودهای کوچک در داخل کشور به هم بپیوندند تا همبستگی به معنای کارساز ایجاد شود به نظر من جدا کردن اولویت هایمان که در زنجیری به یکدیگر متصلن ما را از مسیر اعتلاف دور می کند پس انتخاب هر کدام از ما در جهت شکستن چرخه استبداد به معنی نفی دیگر انتخاب ها نیست جنبش محسا شورش علیه استبدادی است که پیکر زنان را به بخشی از این استبداد سازی تبدیل می کند در اینجا توجه جهانیان را به موضوع اعدام در ایران جلب می کنم که همچنان ادامه دارد و وسیله مهمی برای سرکوب به شمار می رود. من شاهد اعدام زنانی بودم که در پرتو چنین مفاهیم پدر سالارانی به چوبه های دار سپرده شدند و همچنین شما در سال گذشته دیدید که مردان زیادی فقط به دلیل حمایت از حقوق زنان اعدام شدند پس همه این تجربیات به ما می آموزد که نمی توانیم از کنار آپارتاید جنسیتی به راحتی عبور کنیم این مفهوم که در هفته های اخیر نیز دچار تحولات مثبتی در سازمان ملل شده است تا دولت ها نتوانند با نیمی از جمعیت خود هر کاری بکنند و مانند افغانستان درهای مدارس را به روی دختران ببندند به همت کسانی صورت گرفت که نتوانستند سکوت را انتخاب کنند همچنین لازم است بین جنبش های زنان در خاور میانه همبستگی شایسته ای تحقق یابد شاید پس از آن دنیاهای بزرگتری در انتظارمان باشد در اینجا جا دارد نگرانی خود را از آنچه در خاور میانه میگذرد اعلام کنم و به ویژه از دولت های منطقه بخواهیم به کلی از حمایت از دولت یا گروه های جنگ طلب خودداری کنند غیر نظامیانی که هیچ منافع شخصی در جنگ ها ندارند از وقوع یک جنگ گسترده در منطقه بیم دارند و خواهان هیچ نوع جنگی به نام مذهب، قومیت یا هر عنوان دیگری نیستند در پایان ضمن بیزاری جستن از خشونتی که علیه هنرمندان در ایران جاری است که در قتل داریوش مهرجویی و همسرش تجلی یافت جایزه خود را به آرمیتا گراوند و مادرش تقدیم می کنم آرمیتا دختر جوانی که به خاطر هجاب اجباری مورد خشونت فیزیکی قرار گرفت و اکنون در کما به سر می برد شاید آرزوی من برای بازگشت آرمیتا به زندگی برآورده شود متشکرم با امید به دنیای بهتر مسکن Imagine her ability to stay calm and film that video in her home. Imagine the poise and courage that she possesses on a daily basis. It's kind of awe-inspiring. Um, I don't, you saw her last comment about uh, giving the prize of the honor of Armita Jerobond. I don't know if any of you read the paper today, but uh, she was pronounced uh, dead by the authorities today. And no one knows exactly what happened. She went into a subway station without a hijab on and came out uh, in terrible shape, unconscious afterwards. Um, and was pronounced dead yesterday. Um, we're going to hear from a panel of uh, people who know Nasreen and know Iran very well. Um, it's entitled Women, Law, and the Dream of Justice. And we're thrilled that um, the John Nor Norton Pomeroy Professor of Law at NYU, uh, Philip Alston, someone I've 
had the privilege of knowing a number of years, um, will be moderating this panel. Uh, for those of you who don't uh, know Philip's history, he's really one of the uh, most globally, one of the greatest global authorities on uh, international law and human rights. Uh, and he served twice as a special rapporteur at the UN, once on extrajudicial extra summary or arbitrary executions, and later on for many, many years as the uh, special rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights. Gives me great pleasure to uh, ask Philip to come up. He's going to introduce the rest of the panel. And if the rest of the panelists would like to come up as well, um, you'll be introduced by Philip. So on to the panel. That's on, yes, there we are, better. <laughs> um, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, be here to um, try to coordinate this panel, but I'm going to let the three speakers do most of the talking. Uh, I'm not an expert on Iran. Uh, I've long known about Nazreen's extraordinary courage and uh, the work that she has done. Uh, I was struck watching the tributes to her by the complexity of the role that women play um, in the human rights movement generally. One can look at the movie and listen to her comments and so on and think, well, this is about women. This is about the liberation of women. Uh, about freeing them from patriarchy and so on. But there's another whole side of it, which the women's movement in Iran symbolizes for me. One of the things that was really striking when I was the UN Special Rapporteur on executions, uh, which is a delightful topic to be uh, pursuing in different places around the world, uh, was that in quite a few of the countries that I went to, and they were all in their own way uh, in pretty dire straits by definition, it was the women who were the strongest, the women who were the most determined to confront authority. And uh, I remember vividly situations where men would sort of step up in the usual male way and say, well, I'm here to talk to you or whatever. And then they would sort of collapse in a heap uh, when asked questions. And it was the mother or the sister uh, or some of the women activists who would do all of the real work. And I think that's one of the things that is so striking about this movement in Iran, that yes, it's for women, absolutely, but they are also taking the lead uh, in a quite remarkable way uh, in calling out tyranny, as Nazreen called it, uh, and trying to bring fundamental change uh, within the society. Um, and so I think it's really important to, you know, just see it in a, a more complex way. But uh, I want to move immediately to the panel, and perhaps I'll introduce them uh, in order. Uh, the first panellist, who has already accepted the prize on behalf of Nazreen, uh, is Dr. Hale Esfandiari, uh, who herself um, spent uh, 110 days uh, in the 
not the Hilton Evin prison, uh, a truly, probably in some ways, the world's most notorious uh, prison in terms of uh, atrocious conditions, uh, systematic abuse. Uh, and she wrote uh, a wonderful book uh, about that experience, has been living in the United States uh, pretty much since the Iranian Revolution uh, and working tirelessly uh, on these issues. Uh, so no one is better equipped to talk about uh, Nazreen and the significance of her work uh, than Habe. Having me here, it's an honor and it shows a trust of Nasreen, although we <coughs> live on two different continents, that she believed I would be the right person to accept the, the award on her behalf. Um, the Iranian women really uh, have been very central to the development uh, in contemporary Iranian history. I mean, the women's movement started in the early 19th century, and it has been moving very fast. And I'm going to spare you with all the historical events of the last century, but I must I'm just focus on the last 40 years for years. On the eve of the revolution, the Iranian women had almost, and I'm repeating the word almost because Nasrin is a lawyer, and I have to be very careful with the words I use, had reached almost equality in the society they live. Equal access to education and employment, um, access to government position. We were the only country in the Middle East who had uh, two women ministers, the Minister of Education and the Minister for Women's Affairs. Um, we had a very progressive uh, personal status. So I keep on saying we because I was part of that movement. Um, and the personal status law for the first time in the Middle East I mean, and in Iran raised the age of marriage for girls from 15 to 18 in Iran. Um, unilateral right of, the, of divorce was taken away from the husband. Women could become judges and would preside over courts. Shirin Ebadi, the former Peace Prize winner, was one of them. Um, in, in the case of divorce, women could gain child custody. And all these progresses was there. And in a, uh, as a friend one day told me, no door was close to us. Come the revolution, there was a an enthusiasm by men and women for the revolution. So women participated in all the demonstrations that uh, to push for a regime change. One of the first uh, decisions of the Islamic Republic was uh, suspending the personal status law. So overnight, the age of marriage in Iran became nine. Child custody was taken away from mother. Polygamy became again acceptable. And certain fields in the, in the universities were close to women. Plus, segregation uh, in the schools became also the, the law of the land. And the hijab 
you can mandatory before the revolution you could I think you could wear the hijab or not wear the hijab you know a very famous uh, Islamic scholar uh, once said that in the streets of Tehran and other Iranian cities you could see the mother with a full veil and the daughter in a minister and this was acceptable Anyway, so once the hijab became mandatory, women poured that into the street. And it took the regime with, you know, by surprise, because these were the same women who had protested against the regime. So they were there. They protested and nothing happened. They were arrested and they were put in jail. And they had been working to change the law for the last 40 years years. And what you saw last September, when thousands and thousands of women came into the street and protested against the job and against the killing of Massa and me, was the continuation of this movement. And there was, of course, Nasrin and a number of other leaders of the women's movement who really pushed for change. So for 40 years, we have had the children of the revolution, the girls who were indoctrinated, now rising up against the measure of the regime. And that's why when you listen to Nasrin's uh, presentation, She focused, on, she focused on three points, courage, solidarity, fighting the death penalty in Iran. But what was to me very striking was her note of hope and optimism despite the immense difficulties that she and so many others, like those honored by the Train Foundation, have faced worldwide, she remains as always committed to breaking what she calls the cycle of tyranny. Thank you. Depressed, I suppose, is the word, and to uh, lose optimism. Um, but the key thing that distinguishes someone like Nazreen and distinguishes almost all those who are really making a difference is that optimism that it can be done, the battle is not lost, and we can do it. Uh, and she really is an extraordinary inspiration as we saw in that uh, uh, video clip uh, earlier. Uh, our next speaker is David Remen, who is a professor at Brunel University in London uh, in both international law and Islamic law. Um, he uh, succeeded uh, Asma Jahangir uh, in 2018 as the UN Special Rapporteur on the human rights situation in Iran. I think he's been performing today um, at the UN, uh, presenting his report to the General Assembly. Uh, he's done a series of reports over the last five years, uh, which have been made a, a really major contribution in terms of uh, exposing uh, developments in Iran. And his most recent report of, I think, basically today's date, uh, focuses very largely on the role of women uh, in Iran today. So welcome, Jane. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope I'm audible to everybody. Yeah, thank you. So I begin by thanking uh, Dr. Olson. Uh, I have read you over the years and uh, great uh, admiration for, for your uh, contribution to international human rights law. 
Uh, we are here to uh, pay, our, pay our tribute, and um, indeed, it's a great honor for me to be talking to you um, uh, on the occasion of the conferment of this award to um, Nasri Sathode. Um, she has indeed been a source of enormous inspiration for myself and many of the human rights defenders, uh, both inside of Iran, but internationally. Um, as you will know, um, we have many independent experts, especially procedures consist of uh, human independent experts. And all of us, um, I believe, with great conviction, applaud the birth of National Security Day, her bravery and fairness in defending the rights of the Iranian people. Uh, notwithstanding that she has been under tremendous pressure, uh, she and her family uh, have had to withstand. She has suffered uh, you know, great obstacles. She has been detained arbitrarily. She has suffered due to COVID period. And notwithstanding all of this harassment and intimidation and serious violations of her own rights and the rights of her family, she has decided and she continues to campaign for the rights of the people of Iran. Uh, in this brief um, opportunity, I, I mean, I have so much to, to, to applaud um, about the birth of Nestle, truly inspirational. But I will just uh, mention three aspects which have inspired my own work. And have, I have learned from Nestle, which have uh, contributed to my understanding of uh, the human rights situation in Iran. So, um, I want to briefly touch upon some of the issues, and uh, I think you will see the film as well later on, um, where Nestor uh, has been actively uh, uh, promoting and protecting the rights of individuals who are accused of, uh, of committing a crime and are sentenced to death. Uh, and in particular, her work on protecting the rights of the juvenile offenders within the Iranian criminal justice system has been uh, hugely substantial. Um, now, but before I move to juvenile offender executions, I would just say on, on the point about uh, execution of women and girls, um, it is shocking that Iran is the largest executioner of women in the world. And it is equally shocking <coughs> that Iran is per capita, has the highest number of executions. So just uh, this morning, when I was speaking in the United Nations, uh, I mentioned a figure of uh, over 500 persons executed last year. And we, have, we are almost reaching that figure in October of this year. And there has been an, an exponential increase in the number of executions related to drug-related charges. And already this year, we have over 300 persons who have been executed uh, for, on, on drug-related charges. And, and a majority of them are from ethnic uh, minority uh, you know, areas of the low genocide of So coming back to the, to the issue of uh, juvenile uh, offender execution, it is shocking uh, that within the Iranian system, Girls as young as nine and boys as young as 15 could be executed. And during my time as a UN Special Rapporteur, I have indeed come across many cases where very young persons, juveniles, have been executed. Now, the trick which the Iranians use is that they arrest them, charge them, and convict these, uh, these minors uh, on charges of uh, you know, serious crimes, which they call uh, as, as, uh, as deserving the death penalty. But they wait until these children reach the age of 18, and then they execute them. Uh, and Nazarene has been working tirelessly to protect many of these minors. And I've, I saw in that film, and I, I'm sure you can see that. Um, that which has not always been the case that she has been able to protect 
and save the lives of these innocent children. But she has, you know, she has worked tirelessly, and I, I, I really applaud and appreciate what she has done for these juveniles. The second point which I want to raise, and that's, that's a very important one which has already been considered and discussed, is uh, about Nazrin's work relating to promoting and protecting the rights of girls and women. And all, of course, uh, since last year, we have seen this campaign uh, you know, um, led by women and girls, led by women and girls, <coughs> uh, against this policy of enforced hijab. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, Nestle has been right at the forefront of defending the rights of women and girls who refuse to accept this state's brutality and oppression and harassment. Uh, and uh, she is a defender of all of these girls and women who say that they will not be humiliated, they will not be harassed, they will not be tortured or killed by the state simply because they refuse to accept uh, wearing this enforced veiling policy. So, um, uh, enforced veiling is obviously really disturbing, but there are many aspects of oppression which women and girls face. In fact, I have called it uh, on many occasions gender apartheid, and, and many aspects of this have already been mentioned. But I will just briefly mention to you uh, a few areas where I think there is extreme concern. One is the extremely low age of marriage. Now, in terms of law, and as it said already, um, the law has changed itself. Uh, so currently the position is that girls as young as 13 could be married off um, with the consent of the father and with the judicial consent. But even younger girls can, be get, can get married. So in fact, there is no a lower age. See, uh, and we have come across many young girls, uh, 9, 10, 11, who have been married forcibly. And, and, and child marriages, as you know, uh, are forced marriage. Uh, they violate, uh, they destroy the life of, of a young child. So, so that is extremely worrying. Uh, in Iran, uh, husbands continue to have authority to prevent their wives taking up employment, which the husband thinks is, an, is incompatible with the family's interests and dignity. So in fact, the husband can prevent uh, his wife taking up any form of employment. Um, the wife requires husband's consent to obtain a passport uh, and to travel abroad. Uh, and again, the husband can actually place restrictions or refuse that permission. And therefore, in many instances, uh, women would not be able to travel if they don't have consent of the, of the husband. Um, almost no women are represented in senior decision-making positions, with women being ineligible to become <coughs> adjudicating judges within Iran. So you will not find uh, women judges in Iran. <coughs> um, as I already said, there's gender discrimination in the, in the case of criminal responsibility. So girls as young as nine have criminal responsibility. And that age of nine, by the way, is the lunar year. So it is much younger. Uh, that are on calendar. Um, and, and it has very serious consequences, including, for example, on the convictions of uh, Isar, which is murder, and Hadoop, which results in death penalty. Violence against women, protesters, <coughs> or women in general, persists. There is continued harassment, arrest, and imprisonment for any um, women's rights defenders, including those campaigning against compulsory bailing laws. And I would also say that the laws of Iran uh, exonerate uh, violence against women. So, for example, when a husband claims that he killed his wife because he suspected her of having an adulterous relationship, he, he, he is exempt. See, he is exonerated. See. Similarly, when there is an issue about a uh, father, uh, honor killing his child, he, he gets exonerated because he is the owner of the blood. So this, these barbaric laws are justified by this Iranian regime 
and it is important and this is completely unacceptable. Uh, the final point I will just make uh, briefly on on uh, on the issue of protests that we have seen since last year, and these are connected. So, uh, and post hijab was one issue because it resulted in the immediate uh, you know, provocation because of the killing of Gina Masani. But there are many issues which combine together to, to galvanize the protest in, in, uh, in Iran last year. Um, I told the UN General Assembly just this morning that over 560 persons, and I'm sure there are many more, who were killed by uh, the state, it included dozens of women and children, and yet we see no accountability. There's been no accountability for the killing of Gina Masani, and there has been no accountability for the killing of these hundreds of people who were innocently protesting. And, and I was just close by saying that, in fact, uh, seven uh, of the protesters were being made in And uh, just to come back on the point that Nasrin uh, Sassoudi has been campaigning tirelessly for the rights of individuals to peacefully demonstrate and protest. Uh, the state has been ruthless to repress the same form of peaceful uh, demonstration of the right. Thank you, uh, Javed. Um, he really is the, uh, the person who is following most intensively uh, all of the developments in Iran. Uh, and that report is, uh, uh, is not a happy one. We'll come back to that, and I'm sure there'll be questions uh, shortly. So the third speaker is Amir Soltani. Uh, a, uh, a young man who I've just met for the first time. Um, uh, Amir is a filmmaker, uh, a human rights activist, a writer, uh, and a general troublemaker uh, in the best sense. Um, he uh, is particularly well known for a graphic novel that he uh, wrote and put online immediately uh, back after the 2009 elections called Zara's Paradise. Uh, and he's continued to play a really central role uh, as part of the Iranian American community, uh, ensuring that we don't lose sight uh, of the drama that is going on and that we don't lose hope in terms of bringing about change. So, very good to see you. Can you hear me? Yeah. What Philip didn't tell you is that almost 40 years ago I was a student. So, so um, you know, every civilization is formed around some kind of meme. And um, I'm going to share with you the meme that the Iranian civilization is formed around. And it's a, it's a poem by Sadi that's very cliche. Um, he was with, Sadi is one of our great 13th century poets. He was at the shrine of John the Baptist, so the legend holds, at the great Damascus Mosque, where a very unjust ruler asked him what he should do. And so, sadly, is uh, said to have um, uh, sort of composed the poem Bani Adam then. Now, share it with me. Human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one is inflicted with pain, Others, other members by an easy will remain. If you have no sympathy for, for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. This is a poem that graces the United Nations, the entrance of the United Nations. And for me, Nasreen is the civilizational figure who embodies these words. Um, and that, that embodiment has come at great cost and great expense. But here she is, she's a universal figure. The, my first, uh, so I'm going to do three things with you today. First, I'm going to tell you why she matters so much to me. Second, where she stands in terms of the, where she and the Woman Life Freedom Movement stand 
in terms of the global movement for women's rights. And then third, what we're up against. These, these three pet kings. I was 12 when the Iranian revolution happened. I went, went to school near the Alborz Mountains. Beautiful screen comes down that valley of Dayake. It really is a vision of paradise where you'd imagine Iranian poets creating the beauty that most of us associate with Iran. On the other side of my school was Edin Prison. And both before and before the revolution, you'd ask about Edin Prison. And there was always a hush around it. You know, I mean, I was 12 or so, and I said, what's going on there? When the revolution happened, there was a sense that Edin would be opened up in this age of political prisoners and so on, torture. All of the things that were, were attributed to the previous regime would come to an end. That didn't happen. So at the age of 12, I, uh, I was sort of witnessing friends of our family being executed there, being tortured there, fake executions, all kinds of horrors. And in a way, that kind of trauma, when you experience it as a child, shapes you forever. You stay focused on that, and you, and it actually ended up defining me, which is how I ended up being Philip's student, human rights law. I thought, oh, I'll go and learn the law, and that I'll find the key to opening the gates of this prison for me. And of course, 40 years later, and I'm still searching for the key, but Nesrin has been that key for me. And the other women in Edwin Prison, and Arshak Prison, and all the other prisons in the Because, so the moment, the way I got to know Jeff and Marsha and Penn was when Nasreen went on a hunger strike. Um, she'd gone on a hunger strike during COVID, political prisoners were being exposed to COVID, and she went on a hunger strike in protest of that. And to see the majesty of a woman who turns her body Right? Her body is controlled. But she, through that hunger strike, was actually reclaiming not only control over her body, but also over voice and presence and so on. She wasn't disappearing in that prison. And the majesty of that hunger strike, the way it connected people all over the world um, and allowed us, as activists, through Penn, through Jeff and Marsha's film, through Geraldine's friends in the film world, to really bang on the drums and raise awareness about what was happening to political prisoners in Iran. And this ability of hers to always turn her life into a shield for other lives really moves me incredibly. So then now, why is she a civilizational figure? When we, um, when we talk of Iranians, when we Iranians talk to each other, we're always going on and on about Cyrus the Great. You know, oh, human rights began with us. Oh, religious liberty began with us. This is who we've been. But when you look at Nasreen in terms of deep time, deep time, and you consider that, hold on to that saggy poem, 13th century poem. But when you look at Iran in terms of deep time, and you look at uh, women's rights in terms of deep time, at the time of the French Revolution, it took us you know, 1,700, 1,800 years from the birth of Christ to write out a single sentence, all men are born free, um, all men are born free in dignity and rights, free and equal in dignity and rights. 1789, fast forward Second World War, 19, you know, after all the disasters that we inflicted on each other, you know, Hiroshima, um, the Blitz, Dresden, Tokyo, all of that disaster, all of those disasters. Eleanor Roosevelt and a gang of women become the force behind the Universal Declaration of Rights. And the Universal Declaration of Rights gives us another sentence, which is again fairly simple, right? In Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. So we go from all men are born free and equal in dignity to all human beings. And the reason that happened was not just because of Eleanor Roosevelt, but it was because of an Indian woman who was one of them uh, on that panel, uh, one of probably Mr. Ramon's predecessors and, uh, and yours, Philip, who said, you know, it's too dangerous for us to say all men 
we have to say all human beings, 1948. Now imagine what would have happened and what happens and what it would mean if we were to go back from all human beings are born free and equal to all men. And in a way, that's what we've seen in one of the attempts in, in Vermont. Fast forward another 50 years to 1995, and we get the Beijing Declaration, right? 189 states gather in China, and what do they say? The big thing that they say in 1995 is the human, the human rights of women and of the girl child are an inalienable, integral, and indivisible part of human rights. 189 states there. Now we come to Iran. In 2017, Bida one woman, one woman, talk about a kind of Solzhenitsyn movement, gets up, takes off her veil, puts it on a stick, and shakes it on Engelhoff Street. And, and that becomes part of what we now call the movement, which is called the Daughters of Revolutions. Who is Nasrin? Nasrin is the lawyer who represented four of those women. And the beauty of what she does, the beauty of who she is, and this is something that Jeff has touched on in the book that um, he's written on, uh, forward to, uh, which I strongly recommend to you. Um, uh, uh, what, what Nasrin believes in as a lawyer is that if she doesn't perform her job as a lawyer, if she doesn't carry out her oath, right, the whole idea of citizenship in Iran becomes meaningless. And that's why she goes into these labyrinths and has to have bridge these extremely difficult um, you know, battles that end up earning her 38 years in prison and you know, 148 lashes. But it's with a vision and that makes her part of a movement that's not just about Iran, it's a global movement. And it's a, it's a movement that really touches us, touches us all. So what is Nasreen up against? What are we Iranian human rights activists up against? If you look at what's happened, you know, the human life freedom movement for me, extraordinary, right? Here you had the Shia Tweedledee and the Sunni Tweedledum uniting because of the impact of the women's rights movement in Iran. Very interesting. And then what do you have? On the day that Parliament is passing a law that's going to really increase the fines and punishments and everything on the people in Iran, who happens to arrive in Iran but Ronaldo, the soccer player, right? 600 million followers, and he completely distracts attention from what's happening to women in Iran. So, so, you know, talk about a compulsory hijab, and who's, who is that hijab? You know, you, so, so, so this is just to say that women in Iran are not just up against the Islamic Republic, they're up against very deadly and dangerous international games. And so, to again appreciate Nasreen, one has to situate her in terms of these, in terms of these um, uh, contexts. Thanks, Amir. Um, I wasn't aware that um, our much beloved Ronaldo had played that uh, particular role. Uh, it has to be said that the uh, club of uh, uh, top league soccer players for human rights is a rather small one. <laughs> um, okay, um, we have uh, 15 minutes or so for questions uh, from the audience. Uh, you can address your question to any one of our panelists. Um, and uh, I would... I'm looking. Um, anything about Nazreen? Anything about the current situation? Yes, sir, gentlemen. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to ask, well, what has the UN done to help the woman in Iran that's made a difference in the past a couple of years with this particular movement? <coughs> thank you. Uh, 
Good question, important question. Something I want to try many uh, civil rights activists. Um, so the brief answer is that the UN um, works within a particular system. I mean, uh, we have the United Nations Human Rights Council, where we debate and uh, try to enter into a dialogue with all states. Um, and we believe that we, we can bring about changes through reform. So specifically on Iran, uh, last year after the protests started, I campaigned very heavily for the establishment of an independent investigative mechanism, which the United Nations Human Rights Council established last year in November. And uh, that investigative mechanism is called uh, the International Fact-Finding Mission, which will present its report next year in March. So that's one avenue where the, where the United Nations uh, where the Human Rights Council has impacted. Um, also, my own mandate, the UN mandate, uh, the special rapporteur on, uh, on the situation of human rights in the Islamic Republic of Iran. I have a role to play. Um, I obviously have my limitations. I have not been allowed access to the country. Uh, unfortunately, Iran, you know, they, they, they say that what I say is too political. They say that they will not accept my, my position or my recommendation. But nevertheless, I can campaign. I, I, uh, I speak to all of the stakeholders. I speak to the victims of human rights violations. And as Philip mentioned, um, I, I produce the reports for the world to expose this regime, the brutality. So I think the, the UN does provide opportunities, and there is scope for us to learn more. And I, I would encourage you to, to speak to your state your individual state, uh, speak to the civil society, speak to international stakeholders, so we can collectively exert more pressure on the Iranian authority. And that is the best tool that we can use <coughs> for reform. Thank you. Yes, Am I right to think that there was a discussion last year after the movement started to suspend Iran's membership from the Commission on the Status of Women? And they did. They succeeded. So you might? Yes, I, I can elaborate on that. And actually, uh, there, was a, there was quite considerable debate. Now, the Commission on the Status of Women is, in fact, as, it, as its name tells us, that it is about promoting and protecting the rights of uh, girls and women. And Iran was sitting uh, pretty on, on, on that commission. Uh, while a, a little bit difficulty hearing you. Just, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, just, to, just to recap, um, in response to the question, Iran has been or was a member of the Commission on the Status of Women, which has the obligation to promote and protect the rights of women. Uh, and girls across the world. So uh, there was a big question as to why regimes such as the Iranian regime is on that commission. And a number of states, and I must say the United States, took a, a lead in that. Uh, and it was unprecedented uh, that the commission decided to remove a sitting member from its, its uh, membership. And therefore, I think, uh, again, uh, that's an example of the UN uh, doing its bit. Of course, we have a limitation. We cannot um, use force or any other excessive steps um, into uh, the operations of a sovereign state. That's part of the UN Charter. But nevertheless, we can uh, work around through dialogue and to persuasion and collectively as international community exert enough pressure uh, for reform to gain the Thank you. Uh, I think I'd just add to that very quickly that um, there is a need in uh, such a complex uh, situation to have some form of objective and ideally authoritative reporting and if the U.S. State Department is saying this is what's going on in Iran, much of the world is going to be sceptical. 
uh, of what they say. Uh, if certain newspapers say it, they can be called fake news and so on. The UN does play a central role and is rarely challenged, I have to say, except by the target governments, uh, in terms of the constant production of these detailed reports about what is happening. And that provides an absolutely essential foundation for so many of the discussions like tonight. So I think that role is very important. Uh, yes, in the front row here, and then... Um, you helped us look back and encapsulate the history of women's rights in Iran, and we talked about the optimism that Nasser has. If that optimism is played out, how do you see looking forward uh, the, the gains that you would like to see in the Nasser would like to see? What would be the, the literal steps that will happen to achieve that? So what's, a, what's an optimistic scenario uh, going forward uh, to really um, carry on, not just the fight that Nasserine has been fighting, but to, to win that battle? Um, be an Iranian woman requires that you have to be an optimist and to you know, look to the future. And uh, I texted Nasreen a couple of days ago. I said, what do you want me to tell the audience? And she said, tell them that to make sure they know that the woman, the movement is not dead. She meant that women's life and liberty is not dead. It is there, and they are working, and they are continuing. So I think there is a, if they give up, their, if we women, Iranian women, give up the hope for change in the future, we might as well just sit at home and end up doing nothing. There is always, the, the horizon is always for us something that is within reach, and that is, fundamental change, no matter what. And I think that's what they are working at and, uh, you know, con will continue. As I said, you know, for me, having been involved for maybe 60 years in the movement, sitting back and seeing how these younger, the Gen Z generation, the generation of Nassim, have not given up. They know that eventually they are a force that will bring, make a lot of difference in Iran and bring to change. And that's why she's an optimist. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I also think that we can't just look at the mud. We can't just look at the number of people executed. We just can't do that. We have to look at what's vibrant and vital in Iran. Iran's art community is extraordinary. The academic community is phenomenal. The middle class, the professionals are, you know, the extraordinary clerics are now speaking up. You know, I, I really think that we can't just focus on what's wrong in Iran because there is so much right in Iran. Like, which country in the world do you have as vibrant a movement as women by freedom? Really, which country? Which country do you have 145 cities and universities everywhere? People moving spontaneously together. In which country around the world do you see the um, diaspora connecting, working the way they do? I mean, I think one of the beauties of working with Nasreen is that you sort of see the connections. You see the connections between us at the civil society level. That's, you know, that's extraordinary stuff. And we've got to promote that. We've got to believe in its power. Oh, and I have one tiny suggestion for Mr. Rahman as we're talking about the UN. There's a carpet that the Islamic Republic gave to the United Nations that has the words of Sadi etched in it. I think we should roll that carpet up and send it back. <laughs> I, I wish that Javé had the power to uh, take such uh, steps. Um, yes, the lady in yellow, is it, I think? 
recently, uh, and the question is how can that uh, be permitted to happen given its uh, record on so many human rights issues? So, Javed? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting next to uh, a leading international lawyer, and, and he knows that he, he would, he would uh, tell us a lot more. He would tell us a lot more about the limits of international law. Uh, just to summarize, you see, we, we, we are focusing here on Iran. But we have to remember that there are many murderous regimes. There are many autocratic and undemocratic regimes sitting in the, in the United Nations. And they are buddies to each other. They will support each other. So if you look at, uh, I mean, if you just look at the Middle East, for example, look at the Arab countries, the Gulf countries in the Middle East, are we saying that, um, that they are democratic? Are we saying that they support the rights of girls and women? I mean, some of them are even worse than Iran, you see. I mean, I come from Pakistan, and a lot of the things that I've said about Iran and I'm really shocked and alarmed, you can also apply to a country like Pakistan. I mean, Pakistan is the fifth largest country in the world. It has over 230 million people. But if you look at the position of uh, minorities, for example, um, if you look at uh, the repression of, uh, of um, you know, of, uh, the right to freedom of religion and belief, uh, you have, for example, death penalty for blasphemy laws. And it isn't just, a, it, it's just not a law. It is applied rigorously. You, you would find people, and I've met some, uh, effectively on death row. So there are many regimes which are, as brutal, or if not worse. And the UN, uh, in terms of its laws, it does not uh, prevent undemocratic, um, uh, you know, repressive regimes from coming into power. I mean, just this morning, I was talking to many. I mean, we have China, we have Russia. They have their own uh, allies, including Iran. So that is the problem we have in, in, in international law and in, in international <laughs> states. That democracy and rule of law and pluralism is not something that we have um, embraced as yet. We are too far away from these values if you look across the world. Uh, well, it's good to hear who you were being friendly with this morning. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, uh, George, one more question, is there? Yeah, one more. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, Actually, we'll take two more because you're almost in a row. Yeah. Yeah. The, the man at the front first and then the man behind. 
So I was uh, interested by, by the comment that the panel made on, on China that, uh, that sort of brought the rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia. As far as we know, you know, the, the narrative has been that they, that they were sworn enemies. And then there was a mention that, you know, that, that women somehow was, uh, you know, was one of, one of the issues. I'd like to understand better what's going on. Is this for real, that China, uh, which is not a democratic regime, is putting together these two countries that are both uh, certainly not looking forward, uh, forward looking with women, women rights? What's, what's going on here? So the question uh, for Amir basically is what is actually happening on the Saudi-Iran front uh, with China brokering some sort of rapprochement uh, and uh, we'd like to hear more. China signed a 25 year strategic agreement with Iran while all of this stuff has been going on and one of the side effects of sanctions has been that the Islamic Republic relies very heavily on its oil sales to China. And China has been using that to deepen its influence in virtually every dimension of Iran's economy. And of course they, um, and, and this, is, this is like, we're talking about concessions, the likes of the Reuters concession, where virtually much of the country is on a thing auctioned off as a way of holding on to power. And China's been the beneficiary of that. I mean, one can't ignore that kind of uh, policy in Iran. I mean, the irony, of course, is that the Chinese premier's daughter went to Harvard under another name. And, and you know, so for their own kids, these elites are very, very uh, sweet and lovely. But when it comes to, you know, Mao was the person who said women are half the sky. The Beijing conference took place in China, but have you heard anything from China about massless death? Nothing. And of course, the Saudis have been selling oil to China as well, and the Iranians were targeting Saudi installations and so on. So clearly, China's had an economic interest in this kind of thing. And um, then, and, and you know, it's not just China. Everyone has been fanning. The, the story of fundamentalism goes back centuries where different world powers have used Islamic fundamentalism in one way or another to play against each other. You know, it's, it's not real. And, um, and I think being blind to that um, is dangerous because uh, if we want women's freedom in Iran, we can't ex ex sort of ignore the great game and its continuation. Just one almost gratuitous comment on my part. Um, I did an official UN visit to China uh, in 2016. And I think one of the things that really surprised me was that China, having been at the forefront in a, at least a formal way in promoting the role of women under Mao and others, um, is these days pretty retrograde. Uh, there, I think, if you've seen the photos of the Politburo, if you've seen the photos of the Party Congress, um, you won't see very many women there. Uh, and the various laws that they still have about equality and so on are very far from the reality of Xi Jinping's China, which is. Uh, rather sad. It's a very significant step backwards. Uh, so, final question from the gentleman down there. Yeah. Thank you very much. First of all, thank the Trade Foundation for recognizing the most, in my view, as a young American, uh, the most prominent woman in Iran as recognizing her for the civil cause. So, thank you to the Foundation. Referred to the very first opposition to the regime was immediately after the revolution of Iranian women rose and essentially protested against becoming the second class citizen. Not very many, there were men that actually support, but not as active as the absolutely star of last year. So many men 
came to the streets to call the Roman right you know, movement. And uh, so that has to be looked at. And Nassim talked about them in, in her videos. I want that to be highlighted that one of the things that Nassim is so great about. So, and as we know, everybody knows that it is the whole time of it. The point that every great woman is a man. So I want to ask, uh, I want to ask Amir uh, and maybe some other panelists, who is that man behind this great woman? <coughs> Uh, at the first time we won uh, seven, and uh, the first two days, no young men came and uh, supported the women. And it was the women who were walking in the street, Gen Z uh, generation, saying, join us, men, join us, join us. So they invited them, and I think the young men felt embarrassed because they thought, Probably in a couple of weeks, we have to be back in class with these girls. How can we look into them? And that's why they joined. <laughs> I think um, the great man, the great man in this story, and uh, um, Jeff and Marcia spoke about him, is Reza Khanna, Nesma's husband, um, who is really astonishing in every every sense um you know raising the children by himself um making sure that nasreen is safe in prison carrying out her vision and actually not just hers it's actually his as well and then you know i want to share a funny story with you um you know reading nasreen's prison letters nasreen does a lot of artwork in prison and she has these lists of things that she wants Reza to purchase for her. Ribbons, buttons, things that you create, you know, handicrafts with. And I always have this image of Reza driving around Tehran buying all of this stuff, you know. It, it, it's such a deep and beautiful vision of what a partnership is. But you know, we so speak say that behind every great man, there is a woman. Uh, but you know, nobody really, and this is a pet peeve of mine, uh, and it's really, I think, important. Nobody, we need to completely look at Islamic history in a new light. You know, um, the Prophet, before he represented Allah, represented Khadija, a woman who was a very successful businesswoman. When he gets the revelation, he thinks he's going insane. It's his wife who, who stands by him. So in a sense, she participates in revelation. So, and, and I don't think that kind of thinking is, has happened, that kind of looking at the role women have played throughout Iran and Islamic history. And I think that revision is really important as well. Education has, education has played a very important role in the relationship between uh, the younger generation between men and women because they have been going to the same universities and facing the same hardship and on the other hand social media has had an amazing effect I always say and I think I told you earlier that I think the regime, the government lost the battle of winning the younger generation to the social media Thank you very much, Hade. I think a, a feminist brief formulation uh, of the earlier comment might be that behind every great woman is a man whom she has managed to overcome or shake free from. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, on that note, um, I want to thank the three panellists. I think it was a very rich discussion. And we turn it back to you, George, for uh, a final. I had a hand I realize we ran over a little bit. I thank you all for, uh, for staying a little longer. We're going to have a reception after this for anyone who would like to stay. And we are going to show a wonderful tribute video to Nasreen that is a part of the documentary that uh, Jeff and Marsha have, uh, have
produced, which I hope you'll all see. And it's uh, to a song by the fabulous West African singer Angeline Kidjo. Can you see? Then we will have justice. 